Do I get to be the first to sign? Yeah. You do. I have to watch to make sure you do it. Good go. job! I turned the face. That's one. Congratulations. Thank you. A toast to Jackie's finishing and to her career. And a highly successful and a highly productive one. We're incredibly <laughs> proud of you, Jackie. Yay! 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 Jackie! There are something like 6,000 astrophysicists in the world, and there's something like 6 billion people in the world. That means that only one person out of a million is an astrophysicist. And today, uh, I'm sitting with two of them, uh, including the most newly minted PhD in all of astrophysics, Jackie Faraday um, of Stony Brook University and the American Museum of Natural History, who just got her PhD. Tell us how somebody actually had the foresight to predict 50 years ago that these things should exist long before anyone ever found one. Well, I think brown dwarfs are one of the uh, classic examples in astronomy of how we move forward in science. Uh, they're these objects that were predicted in the 60s uh, and predicted to be mysterious. Uh, they were in between stars and planets. We weren't sure exactly what they were. And then a grand hunt began to try and find the first one. And for years, uh, for 30 years, uh, people were searching uh, and trying to figure out various different kinds of ways that we could find them. And even the first false candidate round dwarf led to a really, really interesting one conference, a whole conference dedicated to an object that turned out to be false. Yeah. But uh, whole growth in theory and whole growth in people searching for new things, which eventually led. And it led eventually to the first bona fide brown dwarf discovery. But it took from the 1960s when they were predicted to uh, 1995 when the first bona fide one was found. Uh, that long of just trying to figure out how to find them, where to find them, the kinds of techniques we should use in order to find them. And now we're sitting here today because we know of lots and lots of them. But how and many is lots and lots? We don't know of millions of them yet. No, right. There, there must millions. be millions of them, even billions. Right. So how many do we know today? What's the census? So the current census is somewhere around uh, for the objects that are just sitting around in the fields, they're not in, in star forming areas or pretty clusters. It's probably right around a thousand. Just about. Five hundred. I would say five hundred. A little more than no, no, five hundred. No, no. I think five hundred. Maybe plus or five hundred plus right, or minus right, two hundred. Right. So that means that there are some objects that you guys already don't agree on whether they are brown dwarfs or not. So you can't just look at one and say, clearly that's a brown dwarf. And everyone just goes, yep, check mark, that's a brown dwarf. Yeah. Am, am I hearing that? Is, yeah. that, is that right? You're hearing that. Well, okay. there's, well, there's some that you know when they're cold enough. Okay. Right? And they got yeah. methane in their atmospheres and water atmospheres. Got to be brown dwarf. Right. But you work on a lot of things that it's not so clear. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I uh, was trying to work on is these objects are kind of mysterious. Well, they remain mysterious, even though we found a bunch of them, they're still mysterious to us. And if you don't know the age of the objects, you could po potentially be studying a planet, a star, or a brown dwarf. So there's what we call a degeneracy between the three kinds of objects in the temperatures that I'm most interested in, Adam's most interested in. Let's back up a little bit. You're, if I'm getting you right, what you're saying is that because these things are changing in time, and I want you to tell us how, they're not always the same. There's a way of getting it wrong. You actually don't know when you look at it whether it's a star a planet or something in between. Please explain that a little more clearly. So, right, so you, um, stars have this really nice, what you could consider fuel that's burning them, like burning furnaces, and they burn for most of their lives. But brown dwarfs, they don't actually do that burning. The things that stars do, they don't do. Now, so we should be, yeah. It's, oh, yeah, it's, we should not, be, it's not like coal yeah, and oxygen. Like about coal. Burning. It's not yeah. chemical burning. Tell us more. So, nuclear fusion, when you fuse hydrogen to helium, the nuclear fusion processes by which we know that stars uh, shine for the majority of their lives. Um, 
brown dwarfs don't do that. And the reason is, why is a brown dwarf not burning its nuclear fuel? It's made of the same stuff that stars are made of. A brown dwarf is mostly hydrogen and helium, right? Yeah. So what's the difference? So it, it doesn't have enough mass, and so when it was collapsing, the electrons got close enough together that they became what we call degenerate and just halted it. Was this electrostatic? Uh, like they, they charge their positive and negative charge? No, it's, kind of, it's pushing two things together that don't want to be really close to one another. Yeah, okay. So, uh, kind of like on this tree. <laughs> if Are we you all... get too close together? <laughs> Is this what you mean? Like that? Yeah. Okay. If we all got onto this train together, we would all, if we didn't know each other, we would sit far away from each other. We don't want to be around each other. And so electrons are kind of similar. They don't really want to be around each other. So if you push them too close, they just push right back. So it holds the collapse. Are you going to agree? Uh, I'll agree with that. Are you going to agree with that? And what's the magic mass? The magic mass is 75 Jupiters. When you're more massive than that, you become a star, and less massive than that, you fail. Yes. So you study failed objects. Things, we don't have things to that. Use the word we don't. Yeah, fail. we don't say failure. Okay. We do more positive. We like super planets. Is a good one. Okay. Or, uh, yeah. Stellar alternatives. Yeah, it's yeah. an alternative lifestyle. Yeah. We in New York yeah. understand. We don't that. judge. We don't judge. No, I don't judge them. I don't judge them. Now, 75 Jupiter masses is still a heck of a lot of mass because Jupiter is way bigger than Earth hundreds of times more massive than Earth so 75 Jupiter masses means it's already hundreds of thousands of times more massive than Earth so these are not tiny little things okay now could they be one of the more important components in the galaxy is much of the mass of the Milky Way locked up in these brown dwarfs well if you look at the way the mass distribution is in the galaxy, the most number of objects that we have are, uh, or the peak of the mass function, as we call it, is closer to about a third, a third well, of a solar mass. Yeah. So most of the stars are low mass stars. Most of the stars are low mass stars. That's the stars, but what about what about the brown dwarfs? Right, so then it trails off, so... Well, we don't know. Okay. <laughs> For so sure. it might trail off. Maybe it might it keep doesn't. going up. But oh. does it go up enough to make up all, well, all of the mass of the galaxy? Like, are these visible little brown dwarfs all over the place? That they actually make up all of the, they can add up all the mass of the galaxy, all the dark matter that we talk about in the galaxy? Well, fine. We don't know. Our, we don't know exactly how many are there. Okay. We haven't Are they enough for dark matter? No. Now, if you were if you were a betting woman, okay, if you really had to bet yeah. big money, yeah. serious money, right. would you say, would your guess be, would your guts tell you that most of the mass in the Milky Way is made up of brown dwarfs, or is most of it locked up in stars, or in something else? I'm gonna go with stars for now. Okay. I'm gonna go with something else. Okay. I'm gonna go. With... I'm gonna go with dark matter. Yes. Okay. Fine. Right. Right. We can agree on that. <laughs> we will agree on that. All right. That's right. So let, let me let me ask let me ask you a question. Would you bet that there are more brown dwarfs than stars, or less brown dwarfs than stars? I'm gonna bet that there are more brown dwarfs Whoa, than really? stars. Okay. I'm gonna yes. bet. I'm gonna bet there's less. Okay. This, we're bet? on. We are betting fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. No. Whoa. <laughs> Two drinks at the bar. Okay, I'll bet that. Okay. All right. All right. That's that's more realistic. Okay. Now, your gut instincts obviously clash here. Mm -hmm. Now, just because you've gotten your thesis, your PhD done on brown dwarfs, you don't necessarily have to favor them. So there's something that's telling you that brown dwarfs really are much more numerous. I want to know what that is, and then I want to ask Adam the same question. Why does he think you're wrong? Why does he think that, that brown dwarfs aren't the cat's meow in the galaxy? Well, my argument would be that we don't really understand how brown dwarfs form. We don't really understand it. Can you agree with that? Completely. And I'd say, yeah, we, yeah, we, I mean, we don't actually really know how a star forms in detail. So yeah. 
but brown dwarfs yeah. even more. Even so. worse, brown dwarfs. Right. Even worse. Brown dwarfs possibly form like planets do in disks. I showed this in my thesis today. At least one object has an analog, and they also form like stars. We have simulations that show that. So they are, they straddle the both. We know that low mass stars are numerous. We know that planets are numerous. I'm going to go. Brown dwarfs are probably as numerous as stars or planets. Because they could. No, I'm not going to go with combined. I'm just going to go with either one population. Okay, all right. Because right. you can get them either way. So Adam, you're taking the more conventional point of view. You think that yeah. even though you study them, even though you've made a living doing this yeah. and continue to do so happily, you think that they're just the flea at the end of the tail at the end of the dog, well, in the so, stellar distribution. So in mass, they yeah. are. I mean, because okay. there might be a lot, I mean, even if there were more brown dwarfs and stars, these are little stars, they're little tiny stars, so they can't add up to be all the mass. I okay. think that's why I think there's something else. Okay. But the question of whether there's more brown dwarfs and stars hinges a lot on what's the smallest star you can make, and we don't know what that number is. Yes. It might be, it might be 75. We used to think it was 75 Jupiter masses when there were no brown dwarfs. Now. Right. And then we found some brown dwarfs, and that could have been right. Okay. And then maybe it's 10. Maybe it's 10 Jupiter masses. Maybe it's a few Jupiter masses. Maybe the masses of stars and planets overlap. So we just don't know. So. Are you saying that something that's only 30 or 20 Jupiter masses could still somehow be a star? I no, it couldn't be a star. It's okay. simply a brown dwarf. Yes. The problem is that we don't know where brown dwarfs end and planets start. Ah, okay. We have a, yeah. our means by which we're kind of classifying that, which is at 13 Jupiter masses, you have deteriorating. But if you want to go the route of how they form as the distinguishing factor, some of this becomes a name-calling game. Okay. So if you're going to form in the disk, and I want to call you a planet, uh, then you're just taking away some brown dwarfs from my number, and I'm going to lose the bet. Yeah, so now, I, I call a lot more of these things planets than brown dwarfs. Now, there's another problem here, and that is all of these guys that we know, the 500 or 1,000, it doesn't really matter. Um, they're all really local. They live really close to us, within a hundred or so light years, or maybe two hundred light years. And so there is an assumption here about how many of them there are in the rest of the Milky Way. And we're assuming it's the same everywhere. Is that really a good assumption? Should I believe that assumption? Oh. My goodness. Um, I don't think you have to believe that. Okay. Because I think you could definitely argue that you have different densities of stars, of gas, in different areas. It's gonna it's gonna look different if you're closer to the center of the galaxy than it is way out here in the here, literally where we are right now. In, in, the in the suburbs. suburbs. In the suburbs of the galaxy. We're also in the suburbs of Manhattan right now. Right. We're in the suburbs. That's right. <laughs> so I think it's a fine argument. I think it's good for us to admit that we do not know. Tell me what else we don't know. What are the skeletons? What are the skeletons in the brown dwarf closet? Where do you really have to admit that we're wildly ignorant and that we're either making assumptions that are unjustified or we're just utterly ignorant of some of the really key things we want to know? And if five or ten years from now I came back and did this interview again, where do you think you might have made some advances and really pushed the boundaries of knowledge forward? Let's start with the ignorance part. Well, I, I think my thesis today, I talked about a lot of things that were maybe wrong. I will admit some things that I have shown, I'm just showing what the data show, which is a couple of things. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what clouds do and what the age of the object does. Clouds on the brown dwarfs, oh, not clouds here in the atmosphere. No, right, clouds in the atmosphere. So we're basically trying to do weather, meteorology, your Fox 5 meteorology stuff, on objects that are 
light years away from us. And I'm making guesses at what I think clouds, not that are right above your head, but clouds that are on objects light years away are doing to the data that I'm collecting. What are the clouds made of? Silicates, <laughs> iron, uh, refractory elements. Uh, so those aren't the clouds that we have. Yeah, it's not even clouds water clouds. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think one of our big we think we know what's going on, but we maybe we don't know what's going on, is trying to figure out what's happening with the atmospheres. I'm trying to work on this, Adam's trying to work on this, we both might be wrong about what we think is going on. Maybe, 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 maybe. So now let me run maybe the most provocative question by you guys as we start finishing up this interview. I've heard it said that one of the strangest things about our sun, our own sun, our own star that we live around, is the fact that it appears to be single. A lot of the stars you talked about in your thesis, including some of the most fascinating brown dwarfs, are either in binaries, or triple systems, or quadruple systems, or, or more quintuples. quintuples. Yeah. Amazing star systems. And yet our own sun appears to be appears to be single. But I've also heard that we could conceivably have a really faint brown dwarf companion mm -hmm. and not know it. Maybe it's 10 or 20 light days away and we wouldn't know it. So are we forever going to be ignorant or is there some kind of survey or searching methodology that might find out if we have a brown dwarf right in our own backyard? Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool? Well, if so, of course there's the nemesis hypothesis that we... Yeah, we got a name for it already. We do have a name. It's called nemesis. But, but, what, nemesis. but what is it? What is nemesis? So, a nemesis would be a very low mass brown dwarf companion to the sun that is uh, on the order of light days away. And it, it's possible, I think, I can't remember, but it's associated with potential kicking in of comets that cause some of the extinction periods on Earth. Potentially. Uh, and that object is thought to be in the galactic plane, where it's a mess. Well, why is it thought to be in the galactic plane? Because it would have formed with our own sun. No, that's not necessarily. I, the thing is, they, they've looked everywhere else, right? Okay, fine. Everywhere else is easy to look, except the yeah. plane of our galaxy, where there is gazillions and gazillions of stars that can hide that one little star. Yeah. So if it's so, going to yeah. be hiding anywhere, that's the, place that's the last place yeah. for it to hide, because yeah. we've looked everywhere else. And that's the last place we look. Is anyone going to be able to find it? I mean, is it going to be hidden forever? Or in the next 10, 20, 30 years, are there telescopes, technologies, surveys that might be able to pick out a brown dwarf that's not light years away, but just light days right in our own backyard? We have a couple of big surveys that are coming on that uh, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST as we call it, that one is going to be taking snapshots of the sky every day, every two days. So what that would be able to do for us is if there's an object that's moving around, if it were bright enough for us to see, and if it's in, if it's in the part of the sky that LSST is looking at, which is in the south, so that's going to be a telescope in the southern hemisphere, we'd be able to check the images that it takes and see if we can find an object that moves its proper motion, as we call it. But would it be moving relative to the sun? It's connected to the sun. Oh, that's such a good point. Yeah. So I think there's a possibility. If Nemesis is out there, we already have a picture of it. Yeah. But it's hidden in so many other stars that it's just hard for us to piece through those data and actually pick out that one object that's unusual. So, but we're moving around the sun, so we would see Nemesis first from this position and then from that position. So it should wobble, it would wobble back and forth, wouldn't it? Yeah, and it would actually have a big parallel. Yeah. So bam! <laughs> LSST could still find it. Alright, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, you win. LSST could find it. Two drinks.